We're live. Okay. Finally, we are live. Yes. We just had some hiccups and hola, everybody. So finally, we are live. We are ready. Uh, we were doing some fun and some shenanigans here at the uh, show. And you may be asking, who are these amateurs impersonators of uh, Paul and Nicole? <laughs> um, yeah, as you may have noticed today, we are going to be giving uh, our good friends Paul and Nicole a chance to take a break, rest a little bit, and take over the show. So today it's me, your amigo Leandro, and we have also here our amiga. Hello. Yeah, so I'm Marie. Again, I'm still the uh the newest member <laughs> of the devro team um and yeah i'm i'm just really excited to join uh, you leandro today but um like you said we're not nicole and paul but yeah i'll i guess we'll try our best uh to make this episode as awesome uh, as um, as um, as we can yeah i mean um copying or pairing up their awesomeness well we'll bring different yeah. levels different styles and we will talk today about a very exciting topic about uh, performance, automations, front end, all these uh, browsers, all these fun things. But um, before we jump into that, as you may have noticed, we have the usual announcement that we want to open up with. We are hiring here at K6. We have several positions. We have uh, lots of, where is this thing? Lots of roles, jobs. We need Golang people. We need front-end developers, uh, developers, Python, software engineers, senior software engineers. Um, we need help with OSS. We need help with our K6 cloud. Uh, we need help on engineering. So if you are or know someone that may fill up these um, characteristics that we were describing, uh, go on to the page that we are sharing here on the screen and the link that you can see here below. And uh, please take a look, check, and um, apply if uh, you think or know someone can apply for these roles. We would be super happy to have you joining and helping us with so many of the awesome things that we're doing here at K6. All right, uh, enough of advertisements and uh, of uh, introductions. Why don't we get uh, straight down to the topic of the day? What are we talking yeah. about today, Marie? Yeah, so it's an interesting topic. Um, so essentially, we're going to talk about, you know, what browser level is when it comes to performance testing. Um, at the same time, we're going to talk about what, you know, protocol level is. And um, I think, uh, there's this, you know, trend that I've been seeing in terms of like um, a hybrid approach to performance, you know, testing. So, yeah, we can just maybe kickstart as to what, um, like to you, for example, Alejandro, what is browser level uh, performance testing? So performance testing, I always like to open with uh, this clarification. Performance testing is, the, is not the same as load testing. And performance testing at a browser level is a, a specialization of performance testing. We have so many sub practices or specialties on which you want to know how efficient, how fast uh, is your software. But here we will focus and almost obsess on how the browser is doing in terms of performance. Why? Because before, we used to receive on our browsers just the front page, a single screen or a single situation that was happening. And that was it, was kind of, quote unquote, light for the software and easy to work on. But nowadays, applications are evolving. We have two situations. We have a service tier that is kind of defacing the front end, our browsers, from what was the back end through these APIs that we'll be communicating. But at the same time, our browsers and machines are becoming more powerful. We can send more stuff to the browser. And at times, we could be abusing it. And we have almost complete full operating systems just in the browser. Uh, applications that you can see spinning and spinning. But your network card is not working. Everything has been given to your machine. And the performance in your browser, in your machine, maybe the thing that we want to take care of or look at. And of course, at times to see how does it interact 
with our backend being loaded up and struggling with lots of activities. How did I do, Marie? Did I miss anything? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really um, like comprehensive, like detailed explanation. I think just to add something to it, like, because like you said at the beginning, when people say performance testing, or like, you know, most of them think that it's just about low testing. Um, but actually, like, when we want to talk about browser level performance testing as well, it could be just thinking it from a single user perspective. So if I, you know, navigate to a specific website, like what is my, um, like my um, experience in terms of how quick, you know, the page um, like has been loaded? Um, were there any like loading spinners that really took a while to load? Because I think different browsers will have, I guess, like different like render times as well. Um, and I talked about this um, on a previous episode with Nicole when we were talking about like web performance. So I think when we say browser level performance testing, it can also include, you know, the web performance side of things because it involves um, a browser. So I think, yeah, that's also um, a good thing to like just to shout to people. Yeah, it's uh, super important to being able to tell that difference as you very well mentioned it's not the same trying to render a page of let's say internet explorer than on chrome i mean probably some of you may be uh laughing at that but it's true some browsers are better have better performance some others have not the best and sometimes the the functions the javascripts the front ends all the angulars uh reacts and all these front end platforms we may be sending stuff that is too heavy and taxing the machines of our users that are supposed to be able to open our application in a mobile phone, but now they need like uh, massive airplanes of power in there, lots of RAM, lots of... How many of you have seen your machine slow down with only three or four Chrome tab uh, browsers open? Yeah. <laughs> and that's a big symptom of uh, heavy performance that we want to avoid. Yeah. So like going back to that, because now we're talking about like browser based load testing where, you know, we want to launch like maybe like a multiple, you know, Chrome uh, browsers. Um, like why why do we want to do that? Like can't we just like, you know, not open or like not spin up like multiple browsers and achieve the same sort of results? Or yeah, like what's your like thought about, you know, like browser based load testing in general? Well, I think before getting into that, we need to check the other alternative because um, we have uh, the alternative to automate because yes, we want to automate our tests, our processes to easily trigger them for multiple reasons. Sometimes we may just wanna have repeatability of a test. Uh, we have capacities of asserting and do some sort of functional testing at the browser level. And some others, we may want it to scale the activity and try to do a, a load test. That's why it is so different uh, to think performance and load testing because one is checking how's the performance on the browser. And the other one is being able to overload uh, the server, the backend. And the other alternative we have, why don't we do that so much uh, is that rendering a browser bringing up a window as we were already uh joking with it's heavy can become really heavy and most of the time we will need a lot of resources to have four chrome tabs open it's uh if we were joking but it's a true story to bring up a big browser with all the environment all the operating system that they are rendering nowadays it becomes heavy resource intense and all that translates into expensive, right? Especially when we want to do a low test. So the alternative or another or the best practice for simulating activity from a browser into a backend is not to bring the whole browser, but to simulate the communication go the going from the browser to the backend. That's, yeah. Uh, think of um, if we want to overload the post office, well, um, we would have to get browsers pages and start writing lots of uh, letters or we can just print a bunch of envelopes and leave them a bunch of them in in the what's the name of this mailbox <laughs> and overload the postal service 
that's the difference. We won't be working and doing the front end thing, the heavy thing. We're just simulating messages, sending them, which is lighter, easier, and also helps us a little bit to test some of these functional things because, I mean, I may be getting uh, too much into the automation pyramid, but at that tier is easier to do some tests, it's cheaper, faster. Yeah. That, you know, relate a bit with shift left, right? Yeah. So I guess like the official term for this alternative way is via protocol level, um, where, you know, instead of like driving it from a browser, we're, you know, trying to send it to a protocol such as HTTP, which is like the most common way if we're interacting with websites. But there's also like other protocols, um, you know, that uh, that we can try um, and like simulate. But there's there's there are some struggles with both of them focusing on the protocol one do you know marie what are the struggles that we get when we are trying to automate at a protocol level yeah i can i can think of a few because while it has a lot of benefits because like you said it's you know much more um like quicker to run and you know we can easily simulate like thousands of requests um it's not really closer to the user experience um, because, you know, everything is done via this protocol, like we're bypassing like the browser experience. So as such, it, you know, ignores like important metrics as well, such as metrics that are, you know, um, like sort of like related like to the browser world. Um, and you also mentioned, for example, that, you know, modern browsers nowadays, they're becoming more and more complex. So the scripts that we um create from a protocol level can get like it, it it can get quite long it can you know be quite complex whereas if we i guess do it on the browser let's just maybe think of like a login scenario and if we try to simulate that on the protocol level we would have to you know um code a lot of you know like workarounds just so that we can uh simulate that flow so it can get quite um lengthy it can get quite complex and i guess as your application grows there's also that there's also that maintenance sort of like problem because it can get quite difficult to maintain as your application grows in yeah in like in like um like a much like higher scale yeah, there are there are so many impacts on or not disadvantages like missing pieces on the protocol uh, level automation because of course you see what it happens when you send the message and what happens in the back end how long it takes but after that what is behind your if you're focusing only on protocol you're kind of oblivious to that but at the same time these protocol messages are as you very well mentioned it's like lots of code lots of nowadays with apis and services it's becoming a little bit more transparent to see what this protocol message is but there are times where it is just matrix code that you have to forge and simulate that request is uh gibberish that you are not sure what it is just like try to look an html page all the code everything that you have probably to send or receive and that makes it somewhat complicated with forging these messages where you have some things like correlations when you have things like gathering uh the username password uh, credentials tokens all those sort of things parameterizing to adding uh what value do you want to type on the uh, text box and then click submit it's quite different, not as transparent as you would see on a browser animation where you have dot form, dot text box, dot type uh, something and submit. Yeah. It, yeah. it kind of, I, I feel bad calling it all here, but um, it's, it's not as straightforward, let's say, right? Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a really good point because, like, say, for example, like, you know, software testers who wants to, you know, start doing test automation because I, I started from a UI perspective because it's, you know, something that's visual. I can see it happening and the APIs are much more easier to understand. So there is also that level of, like, um, it doesn't, you know, I guess, 
take a lot of um, like learning curve if you want to start on the UI automation. Whereas if we go down like the protocol level, then you know you would need to I guess um, spend you know more time trying to understand how things work. No, and it has some challenges as well in terms of support and maintenance. I know that at the front end level, one of the objects changes name and it crashes all your automations and it becomes mayhem. But sometimes um, when it's still like it looks the same, the front end animations may keep working. But in the back end, a change that is completely invisible to everyone but the protocol can break your animations. So it has uh, this double edged sword where uh, I cannot say it's super easier to maintain because at the browser level animation, you, you already smile when I said an object changed name and everything goes uh, funky. It's it's similar in the back end. So this automation, given that the code is a little bit more complex or gibberish to say, uh, uh, say it in a way, it can get interesting to maintain. I mean, both of them get interesting to maintain. I won't say it's super easy. Some tools give us drag and drop or codeless uh, capability. Yeah. They are more common in the browser or front end uh, realm. We have a few in the performance realm. Uh, I mean, in case it's cloud, you can generate your code uh, automatically, uh, codelessly. But they have some disadvantages. I mean, mm. and a big disadvantage that I have seen where you were saying, uh, why would someone would like to generate load from a browser? Uh, even as we already said, it's heavy, it's expensive, time consuming. Even an execution from the browser, if you are doing it at a protocol level, it's submit, request, submit, request, submit, response, sorry, submit, response, submit, response, and that's it, it's kind of quick. With a browser, it's like, uh, it's already running. Wait, 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 Boop. the browser comes up. Uh, wait, 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 now it clicks. Uh, it's slightly slower and yeah. some more cost uh, in that, turn, that realm. Yeah, exactly. But there are some things that are incredibly, can get super complex to automate at the protocol level. I have been there. I have been in projects like, oh my God, I, I don't understand these correlations. I don't know. There's ciphering, there's encryption. There are some things that can make it really impossible. So the only option that you have, if you want to generate load, is bringing all those heavy and uh, kind of expensive browsers mm -hmm. where I, I there, there was no other option. We had to do it that way because, and this is one cool thing that uh, when I was saying that on the protocol level, level, you need to program and think of these token sessions and all that. When you simulate a browser, the browser deals with all that for you. So yeah, them, you don't it's have handled to. by them. Yeah, I guess so. Apart from because I think the main sort of takeaway for this that I can um, sort of understand this browser level is you know resource intensive it can get quite costly apart from that can you think of any other like drawbacks of you know just doing like browser based um like performance or browser based load testing i mean it's uh, most of them are i would say side effects of um what is the the cost or uh, as i mentioned this is lower uh, when you need to test multiple things at a time, you need a browser window for each one of those things. And the other, uh, now that applications are API or service-based, with the protocol level, you can just do the login process, whatever is your authentication, whatever gives you the token that you will need for the thing that you want to test, and go and test it. Just... Um, uh, authenticate and submit, let's say, a purchase order or initiate a process that requires lots of uh, preparation steps. When you are automating with a browser, unless the application is prepared for that, you have to go to each one of those pages. Go to main page, log in, go to the menu, type in the text box, fill up the table, and finally click submit. With protocol and service tiers, you can just log in, authenticate, Submit whatever was all that bunch of stuff that you wanted. I am a proponent. Uh, I call it the Konami code, where video game 
um, in the past, video game testers needed these cheat codes to be able to go quickly to the last level and test it. That's what we want to do. It's the same. Instead of going through all the levels in our Mary Bros and get to Bowser at the very end, we can just get this wrap, um, uh, warp zone and get straight into the end, into the submit part. If our developers create the application in a way that we can turn it into cheat mode, test mode, let's call it, uh, put the code, we have infinite lives, we can well go straight forward to it. That becomes faster. So testing on the browser, most of the applications do not have this test mode, uh, the cheat code for that. Mm -hmm. So most of them, you have to go through each one of the steps, adding up lots of time. The resources that we were saying for a single process that are heftier in a, heavier in a browser, Multiply it for the multi the amount of screens that you can have yeah. to, go through to reach to that point. Yeah, and I guess with browser level as well, like everything has to be like integrated before you know we can properly test um, it from a browser perspective. Because I guess from a protocol level, we can test individual you know components, we can test individual APIs, but then. When it comes to browser level, we can only really test it fully once everything is, you know, sort of integrated in a single environment. So um, that could be like like a problem, especially if you want to try and catch like all the issues. And so it's like really limited in terms of like the scope and like then this is where protocol level like really shines because you can get started with it. I guess as quickly as you know um, as you can, as opposed to doing it on the browser level. That's that's an interesting point that I haven't thought of. Cause the the browser base, you need the buttons, the components, and again, if any of those changes, you are a big problem, and your automation has to be reworked. But on the back end, on the protocol level, your API calls, as you very well said, you could even start creating your automations before the API exists. You know what do you have to send? You know what should be returned? OK, I know what token, what authentication is needed. Quick and easy. I have my headers, everything that is needed around it. And I can work on it. And most probably, they will be stable. APIs do not change that often. They don't have those. The only key thing that I think the browser automation when you're trying to simulate load is better, is that you have to go through all those screens and each screen triggers a bunch of APIs, bunch of things that at the protocol level, you have to do an automation for each and always be vigilant that the utilization that you are simulating for each API element on each one of your screens is triggered at a representative volume than what you see in the browser. Because if in the browser, someone removes a, an API, uh, what's the name of this thing? A, um, these modules are like a graph, a dashboard. It doesn't break your script. No one notices it. The dashboard gets away, but your backend stops getting hit um, by that. So in your protocol level, you will have to remove that or tone it down because it's not anymore in the front end. In real life, it's not triggered as much as it is in uh, it was before. So you have to tune that, and your browser automation probably is triggering that automatically. So there are both uh, interesting things that you will get in terms of benefits. Or um, I mean, the approach there is to stay up with your observability platform for your utilization in your solution and see, OK, why suddenly we're not seeing this uh, dashboard uh, in the screen or Ah, it's driving me nuts. What's the name of the modules that you can put in a React main page? Like React components? Components or features toggles? No. Ah, I, <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> <at me>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you remove or add, or add some of those, your performance scenario design changes drastically if there are changes in the front end that probably your web browser automations won't even notice. They, they are not yeah. clicking on it. It's there. They are rendering or not rendering it. And they keep moving to their section. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, so just moving on, because I think we sort of discussed already um, the um, idea on why we shouldn't just use one over the other. Like, there needs to be some sort of like balance approach. Um, but 
is there like a scenario that you can sort of think of that you know um that it's like applicable to only use one so if you only have to pick i guess browser level or protocol level um is there a scenario that you can think of where it's just okay to use one of them oh that's a a, a very big it depends uh, <laughs> as always um <laughs> Most of the time, I would say, if you are trying to do load testing, protocol. Protocol is the first choice. If you want to see what is the impact of lots of users working on the application, go for protocol. It's the cheapest, fastest, kind of easiest to maintain, to trigger, generate more uh, volume on users. And But if you're mostly worried about the performance in general like not not about load like on a daily basis i would highly recommend to have some browser automations triggering here and there to continuously have an idea of what is happening in in, in terms of performance how long does it take to render the main page are those extra 50 dashboards that we added to the home page interfering with the browser performance it does it does uh, so we can figure out so many of those things when we are more interested in the performance or the end user experience mm -hmm. in general rather than just in load and as, and, and as we were mentioning earlier if uh, the only option to simulate load that you have is rendering a browser so be it you will have to get lots of containers put them in the cloud and speeding up uh, a lot of um, it gets expensive, I have to you say. Spend some money, yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. Especially if you have to go to the uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions and millions, it can get super expensive. Yeah. yeah. So there's actually um, a question here from um, Alien FPV. Uh, so he asked, will there be some examples on what, on what hybrid performance testing looks like? So I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll address this now, but later we're actually going to show you a demo on um, how you can um, in, on on how you can write both browser level and protocol level in a single script. Um, so yeah, just to let you know that we're gonna also do that as part of this um, episode. Um, but yeah, and I think now up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, from the question, I think the very best option is to do the hybrid. When you are asking me one or the other, the best, very, very, very best is always to have some hybrid. Or if you cannot afford let's say during a performance load test to have a, a browser automation, go and manually trigger some stuff and see how it is doing while the performance is under load. Those are the best mixes. Don't, don't uh, cover only one side. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because now that you not now that we've mentioned what the hybrid, you know, approaches to performance testing, I guess just to formally define that, um, in case other people are still a bit confused. So um you can also add what your definition of it um after. But I think for me it's really about combining both browser level and uh protocol level where you have a scenario um in which in the protocol level you're simulating like a lot of your like a bulk of your request like your typical load test but then at the same time like you said you want to observe what's happening on the front end so um a recommended you know practices you know to save costs do the bulk of the load test on the protocol level and then you can have like i guess like five you know to ten browser uh, virtual users that you can um spin up that will interact with like your application and then just see like what the impact is because then you have a fuller picture of your application's performance rather than just doing one of them um is that sort of similar to what um to what the definition uh, for you is yeah, I I actually would add a few levels of complexity. Not when I talk about hybrid, yes, browser based, yes, protocol based. On the browser side, make sure that your application also has. I mean, with our automations, most of the time we can catch uh, things like a rendering time, response times for these things, the page, all all those uh, fun metrics that we can get from the browser. But having a good observability suite is super important on both sides 
uh, have monitoring and instrumentation on uh, the backend, know every API, every process, how do they connect to the database, how everything is doing on that side while you are doing your performance tests. And on the front end, have some ROM, uh, real user monitoring, or some injections that are done in your application's code to automatically pull these things. Mm, who knows, uh, hopefully not, your script may break, may have some kerfuffles happening, but you still will get those metrics from your observability suite. So uh, ROM, web automation, protocol, and backend monitoring. That would be the true hybrid uh, from my perspective. And I, I, I would add a, a comment on, if you have good ROM observability and some browser automations, you can know the performance. I've seen so many organizations worried of what is the impact of load on your browser when load is happening. And I'm gonna do a quick, silly example. Let's say your browser-based uh, application is an I IKEA furniture. You, you bought it, it comes in a box, the protocol, the package, and your browser has to open it, assemble it. It could be super heavy, complicated, or it could be just a frame that you just flop and it's good, done. When you receive the package, it doesn't have to do on how overloaded is the back in the factory, the IKEA store or wherever you can get it. When you receive it, it doesn't have anything to do with load. The performance on your front end, now it's yours. Now it's your problem most of the time. Because maybe mm -hmm. another package from IKEA was a hammer that you absolutely need to complete the installation. Then you may want to test Okay, when the IKEA backend store is super heavy and bloated and uh, understocked and all bunch of problems that can happen there, what is going to happen with that critical hammer? Is it going to come slower? I'm going to be able to work through assembling my application. So most of the time, they are separate topics. Load and stressing up the backend or checking the performance of your browser application. That's why we were saying, a mix of both, eh, don't obsess on load when you are talking about the browser, and don't obsess on browsers when you're talking about load. So that's big answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a really great analogy, the IKEA furniture. I, I love that. <laughs> um, there's actually a question as well from uh, Terrence. Uh, he asks, you know, with user slash browser experience, does KSIX have capability to simulate different types of users? So, for example, PC versus mobile, different resolution, rendering, uh, etc. So, I think now would be the perfect opportunity to jump on, like, the tooling side. So, I think we're getting a lot of questions related to um, the tooling. So, what I can, um, like, share is because um, as, as some of you might know already, we have a capability to perform browser testing via one of our extensions called XK6 Browser. Um, we've actually just um, updated our, um, our API documentation, so I'll share it um, on you know the uh, the chat, but basically um, we so this this link that I've um, I've shown. Let me just also share my screen. Oh, okay, there you go. So you can see here that we have our um, API docs, and in terms of simulating like um, like different like sort of devices, we do have um, the devices um, like feature for that. So we've got an example here where we're importing um, Chromium as well as devices from uh, the K6X browser um, um, like library. And you can see here that you can just easily uh, simulate different sort of devices. So in this particular example, we're simulating the dimensions for um, like iPhone X. So if you want to also simulate um, like other type of devices, then you can do that. Um, at the moment though, so you can only really um, sort of measure it from a Chromium-based browser perspective, but we do have plans to support like other browsers as well. But for now, um, you can um, try to simulate like different sort of like devices. So um, 
that's that's like a really great uh question because i think one of the things that we talked about like a while ago is you know different browsers like even like different resolutions it will have an impact in terms of your browser performance so you can uh try to test it from that perspective and then see what sort of like performance metrics you get but yep long story uh, long answer um short we do have um support for uh, to simulate like different types of devices with x basic browser and i love that you mentioned that chromium is the only one for now Gosh. yes for now <laughs> there, yeah. there are plans to extend that and and another element of the question on mobile because again this api uh, tier becomes like an intermediary uh, intermediary did i say it right yeah. uh among your web front end and your mobile front end and uh that's another like misconception many similar as we were saying are obsessing of generating load through lots of windows lots of houses to bring your ikea packages which is expensive to simulate lots of houses it's the same with mobile mobile if you want to do load testing do a trigger on the protocol level on the apis that the, the mobile application talks to don't obsess on rendering the performance on the mobile device is another topic battery and cpu and getting hot and burning your leg in your pocket and things that, that can happen with a mobile device we don't experience that much that with a browser but somewhat your laptop fan turns on when you have two chrome uh, windows open so that's that's another tier k6 excellent for the api and protocol uh, automations uh mobile we are not getting there yet uh, as far as i know um but yet I, again who knows <laughs> yeah so in terms of the topics of uh tooling um i do have a question uh so what what other tools are available out there uh leandro in terms of leveraging this like hybrid approach to performance testing because i know k6 is you know one of them and xk6 browser but are there any other tools out there that can also perform you know this type of like approach yeah there are there are several on on one hand um I mean, coming from the, my load runner days, they came up with true client. This is another protocol that brings up a window, very basic functionality, triggers some things. Uh, the interesting thing is that I don't know if they run hybrid because most of the ones that I know will go full browser or full protocol. Um, maybe I, I, I cannot uh, completely say it's not possible because I remember mixing some stuff. And even there are few platforms that will uh, leverage Selenium scripts that will try to bring the Selenium script, create a container for it, or create multiple load generators. I have seen places where they have hundreds of machines, physical machines with the screens. It was like a crazy experience that because you will see a big um, meeting room, lots of machines, lots of monitors, and you would see the clicks happening all over the place trying to simulate load a web browser. I know as well, uh, Flora.io has uh, this capability. Um, I, I also, I'm not sure if they manage the hybrid model, like being able, like natively, because I can think of um, it's like, yeah, have one instance here and one instance here, one runs protocol, one runs this, but not out of the box, not like natively giving you the yeah. option. Yeah, I think as well, like, um, most companies, they would obviously mix and match like different tools. So they're not just using like one tool. It will be a combination of, okay, maybe for, from a front end perspective, we use these tools and then from the back end, we use these tools. But I think um, in terms of like a single tool out there, um, I can't really like think of like other tools that are available that can perform um, a hybrid approach apart from K6. <laughs> No, yeah. and, and we have the option with K6, uh, but being resource mindful, if we are not trying to do like a big, huge load test, on those situations, I would say have your K6 environment doing load on the protocol level and a few ones. And this is another critical that uh, when you're doing hybrid tests for load and I would say in general performance, the 
proportion of protocol load should be most of your load generated through the protocol and a little bit on the browser, just a little bit. Again, you don't need a lot of houses to know what is happening with the load when you're a Kia product and blah. Once you receive it, you need to test that. But once, twice, three users at the, uh, at the most, you don't need to obsess and put a lot of load there. So K6, if you are doing, and this is another interesting, for continuous testing, continue, CICD, it's not recommended to have these big, slow, super heavy things running in your pipeline, as an example. Exactly, yeah. If you're doing smaller things in the pipeline, you can put in a single K6 script your browser and your protocol. Um, uh, you, you will show a little bit how the trick is done. But if you're doing a, I like to call them, a friend of mine is Bolt, the big ass low test. <laughs> make them separated don't don't try to mix because they're your resources will become a situation yeah so um i think just before i do the demo i just want to show um this comment as well from uh vijesh so he said that yeah it's really good to have a hybrid approach which gives full breakdown of um ux i don't know what that is uh plus server time dns resolution latency so yeah the ux maybe end user experience end user ah yes okay that's a new yes, yeah, abbreviation yes, <laughs> yeah so yeah it really gives you that full picture of your performance application you haven't made my toys um yeah so okay. and that, that's 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 another interesting that um from vijesh comments uh, and uh, full end-to-end -end and user experience uh, in terms of performance to know it and understand it. When I said earlier in the hybrid, have a real user monitoring for the browser, have some uh, browser automations, have, and it depends. I wouldn't recommend a full end-to-end -end, uh, overblown when you are doing a massive um, Bolt big at low test. But when you are continuous or keeping taking care, have all the pieces there and run at reasonable levels, not, not unitary, but uh, three users, five users for protocol, for browser, something that yeah. doesn't drive you crazy or slow down your pipeline. Yeah. So now, yeah, I think I'm going to just quickly show to everyone like how you can achieve that hybrid approach uh, with E6. So let me just this so um i think this would you know come with that familiarity already because um since um xk6 browser is an extension to k6 you get that advantage of leveraging the existing features of k6 so uh you can see here that you know we're using um familiar concepts like options and like scenarios um the only new thing um, that's been added uh, here, for example, is, you know, I'm importing uh, the Chromium um, um, like object from K6X browser. And then in terms of, let me just skip the scenarios for a second. Um, so this is like the actual um, example of a browser level uh, script using XK6, um, uh, using XK6 browser. So um, we're launching, you know, Chromium. I'm passing, you know, headless false because um, I want to be able to see what's happening with my browser tests. Uh, once I have the browser object, I'm just calling the browser.new page. So for me to actually open um, a, uh, a page in, uh, in Chrome. And the actual navigation here. So um, one thing to consider with XK6 browser is, you know, we're still in the middle of like updating our APIs because we want to uh, support, you know, asynchronous um, um, like methods as well. So um, currently uh, the page that go to, so as part of our uh, recent release that's now been migrated from uh, synchronous to asynchronous. So you see here that we're doing page dot go to and then using dot then in terms of like trying to resolve the promise. So in here, I'm just saying that, yep, I'm going to this test.k6io slash browser.php. I just want to wait until the network is idle. And then I'm adding like a sleep here because I want to sort of simulate, you know, some think times because not a lot of users will just instantly, for example, click a particular checkbox. And then after that, I'm just passing in the um, 
the element that I want to um, interact uh, with. And in this case, it's just a particular checkbox um, that I want to check. And then using K6 um, check, you know, feature where I'm just adding some, some sort of check here that, hey, I want to check if this uh, checkbox has been, um, um, has been checked uh, successfully. So I'm just going to assert that the text content is uh, equivalent to what I'm expecting. And then finally, just, you know, close the page and then close the browser. So this is an example of a browser script. And then on the other hand, you can have your um, typical uh, K6, you know, script here where you're doing a get request to a particular um, endpoint. And then in this, you know, example, because it's just a really quick, uh, a, uh, a, a really quick demo, I just want to check that the status code is equivalent uh, to 200. Um, the beauty about this is, you know, everything is in one script. And then in terms of what, for example, Leandro was saying that maybe from a browser level, you can have like one or two virtual users. So in this case, you can see that I'm uh, using one of our executor from K6 called constant views, where I just want um, one view, um, um, like trying to send, you know, a request in in a um, in a um, in a in a in a time that's equivalent to ten seconds, um, and in this case, it's just gonna execute the browser function that I've created, and then on the other hand, I have another scenario called news. Again, just to keep it just to keep it simple, it's just using the constant. Uh, we use executor as well, but rather than, you know, one, I want to, let's say, have like 20 uh, virtual users and the duration is set to one minute. So what I'll do now is I'm just going to um, run that test. So I'll just make this a bit bigger. So to do that, we'll just do x 6 browser run and then the actual script. And then you might notice that there's going to be tons of like browsers that are, you know, like popping up. So this is the uh, browser scenario like trying to work. And then when that is finished, it's going to, you know, continue executing the rest of the protocol um, level. And that's really like, I guess, um, like the beauty of this, because if you don't want to use like separate tools, everything is in just, you know, one script and you can just leverage like existing like K6 features. So if you're already, I guess, a K6 user, you don't need to learn, you know, like something new. And um, it's like a really great way just to sort of try to adopt that hybrid approach as well to performance testing. Uh, don't worry about like these errors because these are actually errors from like the application. So these aren't errors from our tests. But once that is finished, so you can see that apart from the usual um, HTTP specific, you know, metrics, we also have some browser metrics here, which, you know, is really awesome because you get everything as an aggregate uh, report at the end, um, apart from like looking at what's happening on your HTTP side, you can also have a look at, okay, these are my metrics from a browser perspective and everything is just, you know, in, uh, in one script. So there's that, um, I guess like flexibility if you want to start, um, introducing, uh, a hybrid approach. And if you already have K6 scripts, then you can just easily add, um, some scripts and use XK6 browser for that. Cool. Um, and yeah, like that, that's really, um, in terms of like the demo, I think the, the main, um, thing as well to keep in mind is I think in this example, I've just used constant, uh, views, but you can also use like other types of, um, executor that are available out there. But yeah, like I think from a, like if you're already familiar as well in terms of like other like popular API such as uh, Playwright, uh, then we are trying to provide um, that sort of like rough compatibility. So you don't really have to learn um, a brand new API. So there will be some sort of like familiarity as well um, for you. And yeah, it's just, it's just very easy, I guess, to combine uh, both browser level and protocol level. Uh, using x 6 browser, so which is really awesome.
And you know, um, looking at this, uh, another big advantage that I see is that generally on the protocol executions, on the traditional low tests that uh, we are used to think of, we receive the metrics from the low test. And uh, mm -hmm. we started in Prometheus, we started at mm. Elkworth, and then we can visualize what is happening. With this, we get a little bit of uh, ROM, uh, uh, some readings of what is the user experience, what is happening for them in our central repository, our time days, uh, beta database, time based database, on what is happening at the backend level, at, um, at, at a protocol level, and on the browsers. Because it's something that, as well, sometimes I, I remember having to code something hard coded on Selenium to submit it to an influx, blah, 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 and be able to visualize what was the end user experience. With this thing that you showed, we can forward lots of these results in a hybrid manner and know constantly what's the end user experience that was being uh, mentioned earlier. So there are lots of advantages. Be careful because you can shoot yourself in the foot over loading uh, just on the browser. That's not a good recommendation unless it's your only choice. But this browser uh, hybrid um, example, it's an awesome one that you can easily pull together. Yeah, and I think this is why, like, for example, for the XK6 browser, we want to, you know, um, like, try to target, like, existing K6 users because it's a really great way for them to, you know, get started easily um, and, like, everything that they know already about K6, they don't have to learn anything new uh, with XK6 browser. Uh, like I said, we're trying to provide like rough compatibility as well with Playwright. And it's just, um, it's just sort of like an easy um, sort of setup if you're interested in doing hybrid approach. Um, there is a question here from Manjit. So he's asking if there is a GitHub link uh, for this example. Of and um, there is. For you. Yeah, so it's actually added. Yeah, so, um, so it's in our XK6 browser um, project in GitHub. So if you go to the GitHub examples, there should be um like an example uh, folder there for the um like uh, for this um like combination of tests um the other one is if you just um go to is it this one our documentation where is it yes yeah so there is a section uh -oh. there called um called um uh, i forgot the name so it's running I wrote this doc, so I should know. So it's so the section is called running X Basics browser. There you go. So there is a section there which includes the same example. So you can just have a look um, um, to that documentation. Cool. And another question. So there's a question from Alien FPV. Do you think having two test protocol and API separated inside one single test script is better? than having them inside one single test. Is that even possible to have them in a single test? Um, so I think we already answered that, right? Yeah, so I think, so maybe there's a confusion in my demo because in the demo, I added it as two scenarios. So it was executed in parallel, but actually if you just want to have a single scenario covering both protocol and uh, browser, you can also do that. You just have to use a single scenario and then maybe you can do like a protocol like test first and then after that you can do the browser level. So you can you can basically like tailor it um, as to what it is that you actually want to test. But the demo that I showed is just um, executing them in parallel because I'm using the scenarios uh, feature of K6. Yeah, be careful with that one because if you put them just, let's say, in the same function block, mm -hmm. uh, like browser and then protocol, you won't have them happening at the same time. You want parallel mm -hmm. uh, yeah. behavior and not like, hey, protocol, now I wait until the browser finishes and then now yeah. protocol. No, we want to simulate some better interactions together. Yeah. And uh, when you're saying when is it better one or the other, I think I uh, already said like having them together when you have light stuff, but when you are interested in a big load test, do lots of the load, most of the load in the protocol one, and then run another one with a few browsers so that you can see what is the impact of load 
on the browser, which shouldn't be yeah. that much generally. Um, I, I actually did this uh, test because I guess um, like we can maybe talk about like the limitations of XK6 browser because it's still like a fairly new tool. But one of the tests that I was doing uh, to help the team was I wanted to run, let's say, like a thousand uh, protocol level tests and then have like maybe 20 or, you know, something like that browser virtual users and then, you know, see what happens. And at first I was using like a very heavy number for the browser level. And I wasn't surprised that obviously that, you know, the actual tests um, crash. But I think, like you said, that's why we need to be careful because even though we're, we are giving you that um that sort of feature to you know let you run browser level you don't really want to um have like a thousand browser level uh tests as well we have another question we are on the ramp down mm -hmm. phase because uh we're about to get to yes. an hour can you believe marie we already <laughs> we did speak Italy. for an hour yeah <laughs> i feel like we need more time <laughs> yeah. so last question can we expect xk6 to be in the core of k6 sometimes in the future currently it's an extension <laughs> yeah i think this is something that yeah um, um at the moment it will stay as um as an extension because it's still um in its early stages so um i can maybe um talk to you why it's an extension because in as I, I guess as part of k6 core the team is quite strict as to what code you know will be added um and the priority for us at the moment is to make xk6 browser first as stable as possible um and once it's fully stable once we you know have i guess the features that most of our users want then yeah we'll have a think if we want it to be part of um of k6 but I guess it's a good way as well just to keep it, uh, just to let everyone know in terms of the limitations. So uh, we already talked about that browser support is still limited. Oh my gosh, my daughter is going. <laughs> um, so browser support is still limited. Chromium is the only browser we support, but we have plans to support uh, WebKit and, you know, Firefox. Um, it's still in a very early stage, so expect that are a lot of our APIs will be will have a lot of breaking changes, uh, especially we're transitioning from like synchronous to asynchronous. And and, and on that question, uh, as well as we mentioned, the f the characteristics of browser based automation is that they are heavy. The part yeah. of the engine, everything that goes around <laughs> it, is kind of heavy and resource intensive. And K6, um, the obsession with the open source tool is for it to make it as light, as slim, and efficient, and uh, as good as possible. So we cannot say it won't ever be integrated, neither um, confirm it, but understand that there's this discussion between the philosophy of having the lightest tool that you can just add on what you need and make it kind of heavier if you need it, uh, and at the same time, understanding that adding this adds up a little bit of toll on the tool yeah. the size of the installer all that is around it so yeah. um okay we are almost out of time marie last recommendation yes. or comment around uh browser um, and animations yeah i guess in terms of like last comment yeah like really consider <laughs> a hybrid approach um if you want to try xk6 browser please do because we are looking for as much feedback you know as possible so if you want to get involved you can raise an issue you can report any like specific bugs and check out our up-to-date guide on how to get started so we've recently just um you know made it much more comprehensive much more user-friendly and if there's anything that's not clear as part of our documentation just yeah reach out to us and we can help you make our docs better uh from my end i think um i do agree with marie we were saying it already quite a bit hybrid is the best only do not obsess on trying to generate load from the browser i gave the example the browser is very good to understand the performance and how it is impacted but as a generating uh, load generating device should be your last choice unless you cannot find other way to automate load because otherwise it's gonna be expensive one way or another not only money time resources people blood tears all that stuff so uh, <laughs> be very um, mindful of what you are automating and where yeah nice awesome we made it yay one hour <laughs> everyone 
thank you very much for being here with us, uh, for enduring, having fun. Happy Friday. Enjoy the weekend. Uh, Marie, thank okay. you for uh, helping <laughs> and with us. Okay. Thank you so much, Leandro. And yeah, have a great weekend, everyone. Take care, everyone. Adios. Bye-bye.